subject, we come the closest to the direct problems of Western psychology as this bears upon the theme or idea of value. Therefore, we begin perhaps by suggesting what is valuable. In Western life, value has nearly always been associated with objects. Things are valuable. Those who have many things are rich. And wealth implies a kind of value. To own or possess valuable things means to us to possess things which have market price. And in our effort to determine the wisest expenditure of our means, we seek to become skillful in determining the relative value of similar objects. In Practical thinking, therefore, we believe in the intrinsic value of objects. Something is worth five dollars because of its shape or its size or the materials of which it is composed. It has what might be termed a fair trade price. But today, most people buy wholesale. Therefore, the first problem that we come against is this idea of trying to secure something for less than its ordinary value. We are therefore bargain hunters. And gradually we learn what the Chinese learned 25 centuries ago, namely that most bargains are worth no more than we pay for them. Zen will go further than this and say that no matter what we pay for anything, it is too much. That factually, there is no essential value in objects. And instead of building our consciousness upon the pricelessness of a thing, our only practical hope is that we can discover the usefulness of that thing. We are therefore paying for some usefulness, which means by extension that we are paying for some service, which this thing confers upon us or some benefit to ourselves. The real value, therefore, lies not in the object but in ourselves. And the object is only important to the degree that in some way it contributes to our own natures. The Zen takes the attitude that everything that we can possibly possess own or secure in the material world is in a gradual but inevitable state of decay. Everything that we now consider valuable will sometime perish. And consequently, uh, it has no permanent endurance. In our way of life today, the rapidity of the perishing of things has been greatly exhilarated. Things are largely made today for the purpose of disintegrating in the very near future. Instead of the natural wear and tear, therefore, artificial termination is built into these things so that in a short time we are faced with replacement. We buy something which is worth so much when we buy it. We take it out of the store and walk to the curb with it. In this little walk of a hundred feet, already half of the value is gone. Now what happened to it? 
it sort of evaporated. We were in the presence of a magical procedure. We also realize that for the most part, this process of disintegration is not marked by any obvious deterioration of the object. The automobile uh, that we drive out of the place where we have bought it loses considerable value by merely being driven to the house. And we may also point out that if we pay a a $5,000 for a car, somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000 disappears on the first trip home. <laughs> Why? Because in the very process of driving it home, the car has ceased to be new. Now in this loss of its own newness, we have a marked loss of value. On the other hand, if we are able to endure this loss of value long enough, we'll say we are able to carefully preserve this car through its period of gradual decline until perhaps we have kept it for 50 years. Then it suddenly begins to increase in value again. (laughs) It no longer runs, but it is becoming priceless for no reason that anyone can discover. And it's quite certain that if you keep this car long enough, you will get more for it than you paid for it. Or your descendants will. Because very few people will maintain the car for that length of time. Therefore, it becomes a rare thing. And scarceness, again, increases value. This peculiar situation certainly has nothing to do with the materials used in the construction of the car. Consequently, we are in the midst of what the Zen would refer to as a complicated process of illusion. Where do all these value factors develop? What do they actually mean? Actually, they do not mean anything but they become important through common acceptance. A thing becomes valuable not because it is better or worse, but because it is scarcer, or perhaps it loses value because it is an unusual abundance. Scarcity, therefore, constitutes a kind of unbalance in the law of supply and demand. Where the demand is greater than the supply, things become more valuable. Where the supply is greatly in excess of the demand, we have a bargain sale. So actually, when we try to determine value, we are quite right when we assume with the Zen that we are dealing with something that has no real existence. Now, there are certain exceptions to this rule, but these exceptions are merely compromises with the essential principle. But in order to try to understand, we must follow the Zen thinking a little bit into what might be termed what kind of value an object has if this object has no value of itself. It must be worth something, some way. If it is totally and completely worthless in all ways, then it is neither desirable nor valuable. Zen says, for example, that one of the important values relating to things is our own attitude in the management of things. That which has no meaning of itself can become extremely meaningful when it is involved in the life of a human being possessing consciousness, thought, and emotion. This consciousness and this thought emotion pattern is exercised by things. 
the sensory perceptions lock upon things. Things are important to the degree that we can touch them and hear them and see them or taste them. They become important as they are objects having existence. Some things gain greatly in importance when they become ours because we want them. Others lose importance to us because they have left us, either through necessity or because we have discarded them. Zen, therefore, takes the ground that all things become responsibilities and that the concept of thing itself becomes the primary responsibility of the human mind. If you have a thing, or if you believe in things, then you must bring them within the pattern of universal integration. You must have an attitude of integrity toward things. The things will never really be true, factual, or real. But the sense of responsibility toward them becomes the basis of human character, as Confucius so clearly pointed out. Therefore, under our economic theory, we can delude ourselves, we can deceive ourselves, these are bad enough, but we can destroy ourselves about things that have no existence. And this is very bad and constitutes one of the problems that we face today. If, for example, we set a value upon something, we then, as it were, take upon ourselves the rules of a game. If we are going to play bridge, we must follow the rules of bridge. If we are going to play checkers, we follow the rules of checkers. And only those players who follow the rules uh, can compete with each other in terms of that particular game. In all rules, it is considered unethical to cheat. And this is also true in the rules governing things. Once these rules are accepted and generally applied, <clears throat> The conscious growth of the individual depends upon fair play. Thus, from his things, he experiences a series of opportunities, a series of temptations. He becomes aware of ways to exploit. He also becomes aware gradually that exploitation itself is not good. So from these things that have no life, meaning, or value in themselves, there descend chains of valuable experiences. And about things, we gain an understanding of the bondage of possession, which Buddha very clearly pointed out. No man possesses anything. Every man is possessed by his own possessions. Consequently, we want to make this load as light as possible. Also, we want to make certain that what we have does not destroy what we are. This is the eternal problem, the ever-present danger, that we are going to gradually mistake these things for value. The Chinese have the fable, of course, of the man in the desert who had been struggling on hour after hour to reach the oasis because he was dying of thirst. And finally he came to this place in the desert where an oasis had been, but there was no longer any water. Therefore his hope was shattered. But another traveler had been there before him and had died there. And this traveler had left behind great chests of gold and jewels. But the poor man who was in desperate need of water could do nothing with these. Therefore, he finally joined the previous owner. 
he also died beside the jewels which were useless to him and which he would gladly have exchanged for a few glasses of water. Thus value has something to do with need. And values are all relative and comparative. Let us say then that a person living in our Western psychology has a certain sense of ownership. He desires to possess. And he naturally desires to possess those things which he regards as good. He naturally desires to have good quality and the best possible uh, materials in what he owns. But he now becomes more or less the servant of these. Buddha tells the story of the man who assembled a great fortune and then was unable to sleep for fear that he would lose it. So he sat all night guarding the money that he made in the daytime until he destroyed his health and died. He could not uh, allow these possessions to be out of his sight for fear someone else would steal them. So with ownership comes the inevitable correlative, loss. With everything that comes, something departs. And the more powerful our sense of possession is, the more easily we are hurt by loss. Possession may mean not only the ordinary objects which we possess, but may also include honor, distinction, and these relative terms for a superior or exalted state of or condition of life. Thus the individual who has lived well when deprived of his means has great trouble in making an adjustment to a simpler way of life. He remembers with happiness only the wealthiest days of his life. All these situations challenge us with the problem of things. Things must be maintained. We know this when we own property or anything of that nature. Things must be kept in repair. We know this when we own devices, machines, or instruments. Things must be kept clean. We know this when we own a home. Everything that we have becomes, in a sense, a kind of master. And in order to preserve some degree of value, we must maintain. And maintain is nothing but the slowing down of the natural processes of decay. The longer we can prevent the object from falling apart, the longer it seems to have some value, ultimately trade-in value for most people. In this process of protecting the things that we have, we may take a series of attitudes which may be uh, quite factual and yet inconsistent in themselves. We may say of an object that we have, I know that it is not important, really. Therefore, if it wishes to fall apart or rust out, I'm going to let it. But this is inconsistent with possessing it in the first place. If this object was important enough in our consciousness for us to buy it and perhaps sacrifice other things in order to have it, we then take upon ourselves a responsibility which can only be met in two ways. One is to maintain and preserve what we regard to be valuable. And the other is to totally outgrow the standard of value by which we were captured in this dilemma. Now, most persons who outgrow things do not outgrow the desire for things. They merely outgrow or reject objects which have lost their newness. And because of our very nature, we desire to possess, but having possessed, lose interest and reach out for other things not yet possessed so that we do not administer the things that we have wisely. 
In this we break rules, and in breaking rules we set up new patterns of illusion which we must fight with in various departments of life. Zen therefore takes the ground that value becomes a great disciplining force. Things become the basis of a game which we must play fully aware of all the elements of the game. As long as we do not deceive ourselves, there is no great harm done. If we choose to waste time in one life, nursing things that have very little value, this is our privilege. Nature will provide us further time to catch up in due course. But if we do accept this situation of things, then we come under a whole group of laws which govern the ownership, the administering of things, uh, their coming and going, their replacements, the methods by which we secure them, the way in which we make the money to buy them with, and what use we are going to make of them. And we even go so far as to fall into the dilemma of how we can give them away without hurting someone else. We come into a whole philosophy the moment we accept the significance of things. In the West, our whole way of life is built upon this philosophy of things. In the East, this idea is regarded as rather childish, but we are assumed to have the right to be childish if we so desire. The main problem is that we must not be juvenile delinquents. If we enjoy childish pursuits, these also must be gently and wisely and lovingly followed with no intention to do damage to another person or to any basic standard of values. Here then is the summary of the point. Things which we desire to have, we purchase at what we regard as reasonable prices. These reasonable prices are based upon a code, a code which in principle all men know. In Western way of life, this code is called a profit system by which the individuals engaged in any enterprise are entitled to a reasonable return upon labor, effort, and capital investment. This is because the way of life in which we live forces us to make a living in these ways or by these means. Otherwise, we are unable to pay our own bills. But because we have this system, we are responsible for the continuance of this system in a reasonable and normal way. Therefore, actually, there are rules as to the absorbing power of markets. There are universal laws governing the percentages and ratios involved in a normal, reasonable profit system. As long as these rules are kept, the profit system itself, which is a thing, gradually disintegrates over a period of 25, 50, or 100,000 years, or something of that kind, in a rather pleasant, non disturbing manner. It grows old genteelly and will finally drop dead, but still we have it. But if we abuse this system, it becomes sick. And the moment it becomes sick, it becomes like a sick child or a sick relative, very much of a nuisance. Especially when we look back upon the situation and come to the conclusion that it is responsible for its own bad health and we are the victims thereof. Actually, when an economic system enters into a state of inflation, 
which we are beginning to learn too much about these days. Our economic system is sick. Now, the only reason why it can be sick is because the people involved in the system are not honest. And therefore, they have not accepted the law governing the very institution that they have created. Now, when you believe in something, especially if it doesn't happen to really have any existence, this immediately involves you in the state of karma. Now, karma is a law that can operate only in an area of illusion. Karma cannot operate in the, war, in the world of reality. Karma is therefore always a problem of illusions which produce pleasant or unpleasant consequences which are themselves illusions. And these illusions in turn become the causes of further illusion. An illusion goes on and on until ultimately reality sets in. But this may take, and usually does take, a very long time. But wherever we have a material thing, we have this karmic cycle set up. This karma does not affect our souls. It does not affect our spiritual destiny, and it does not affect our consciousness but it will affect mistakes which we make mentally, emotionally, or psychically. If we have the wrong attitude toward things, this karma turns on us and makes us utterly miserable. Why does it make us miserable? Because, as one of the Zen masters said, we must sit by and watch the gradual disintegration of something that isn't there. And this is bad enough. In fact, if it happens, we generally visit a psychologist. But the fact of the matter is that these things which we most cherish and about which Western man has built his strongest attachments, these are things which are simply not there. But they appear to be there. They seem to be there. We open our eyes and look, and there they are. But when we say they, they are there, what do we mean by they? We mean things. Now, there are countless things in this world that are there that mean absolutely nothing to us. Therefore, the fact that they exist does not make them important to us. There are some magnificent coconuts growing on some tree in the South Pacific. They are magnificent coconuts, but we're not even interested in them. We don't know they exist. If we find out enough about them, perhaps we'll go into the import and export business. But at the moment, we don't know about them. Therefore, these coconuts ripen and fall in due time, and we do not care. Yet they are as much realities as the fruit on the tree in our own backyard that we are trying to protect from the neighbors. It isn't the thing. It's our relationship to it. Consequently, it is perfectly true that we can open our eyes and see the teapot. But it also is equally true that the teapot has no importance to us except our attitude toward it. If this attitude is variously distorted, this teapot can pass a whole group of karmic pressures on to us. Not because the teapot has them, but because we find in the teapot a catalyzing agent for our own possessiveness. And it thereby turns upon us as a persecuting force. To meet this situation, therefore, the moderate attitude of the wise person is the only protection from inordinate value or value that is not real. If we look into the window and we see the teapot and we go into the store and we were foolish enough to say to the merchant, 
Oh, I want that teapot so bad. How much is it? The price has doubled right then and there. As soon as the merchant knows that we want it, the price goes up. Thus, in our own desire to possess, we begin to enhance our own estimation of the value of the object, and very possibly the merchant. No matter how high he raises it, we'll still sell it to us. He is selling it to us on our own evaluation. We have told him in emotional pressure that we are willing to pay anything, and he charges us accordingly. If the teapot is still the same 50 cent teapot it started out to be, all of the rest of the value is our own emotion. The first comic action, of course, is that we have to pay too much for it. Out of our hard-earned savings or whatever funds we have, we must now pay more than the teapot is worth because we bestowed upon the teapot more emotion than it is entitled to receive. If we'd gone in very simply and said, I need a teapot, how much is that one? We probably would have bought it much more cheaply. Or if we merely wanted a teapot because we made tea, we could watch bargains and find one that would be perfectly useful. But the moment emotion comes in, false value is added. And this false value gradually builds up the concept of inflation. The whole and total concept of physical worth or physical value, therefore, gradually leads us along a way of physical excess until what we now know as extravagance sets in. And extravagance means that we spend more than we should because our own emotional intensities have gained control of our common sense. The more we spend in this way, the more we must earn. The more we demand of life, the more we must give to life in terms of our own honor. Therefore, if our demands and desires are beyond our reasonable means, we must use unreasonable means to secure what we want. This leads to all kinds of unfair and dishonest practices. And all these practices in which we destroy friendships, uh, defraud our neighbors, perhaps cheat our own families, and gradually come to a level of living and thinking in which subjectively we hate ourselves. All of this arises from the fact that we must have a teapot, and we want it so badly that we will pay ten times what it is worth for it. Having done this and shown it to someone else and told him what we paid for it, his desires become immediately exaggerated also, and he offers us twice what we paid for it. And so it goes on until someone drops the teapot, and then the entire bubble of value breaks. To meet this situation, there is only one answer to inflation. There's only one answer to runaway economies, and that is the individual gradually recognizing that things are only use values, that things are only valuable to a certain point, and that nothing is priceless which we can get along without. And man can get along without many things which he now regards as absolutely necessary. But this necessity is not based upon need. It is based upon mental and emotional exaggerations. It is the same, for example, in the problem of accumulating various kinds of specialized wealth. As far as practical purposes are concerned, diamonds are just about as valuable as pebbles. 
they are somewhat more scarce, but not as scarce as the jeweler would have you think. And if the available diamonds in the world today were flooded onto the market all at once, you could buy first-grade stones for $2 a carat. But by controlling the market, you never know how little a diamond is worth until you try to sell it. But the emotional and sentimental factor of the diamond has been given so much exaggerated publicity that it has become not only a symbol of the sacred circumstances of marriage and things of that nature, but it has also become an important status symbol when really it is nothing but a reasonably pretty bit of carbon which has no actual value except this sentimental value. It is said that the Incas of Peru never caught up with the gold standard and preferred to use this metal, metal for roof tiles, which was probably quite good. Made, made very pretty tiles. Today we are worried to death as the supply of it, Fort Knox, begins to dwindle. We have created a great system of world exchange on the basis of metal. We keep on with this long enough and we must pay the karma of it. Not because uh, the relationship is in violation of some natural law. The comic problem lies in the reaction of an illusion upon ourselves and our own insistence upon the perpetuation of that illusion. So if we are going to follow the classical or philosophical thinking on this subject, we realize that independence is not really the result of having more, but of needing less. And that the individual who wishes to have an interesting life and a full life, a life of value himself, must stop becoming the victim of the hypnosis of things. This doesn't mean he has to throw them away. It doesn't mean that he has to cast all of his goods upon the world and so they will all be hypnotized by them and go out to be a hermit somewhere. Nor is it necessary for us to follow the example of Diogenes, who suddenly deciding that uh, his water cup was a sordid luxury, threw it away and drank out of the hollow of his hand from that time on, declaring that there was no better vessel ever made. He was probably right, but it was a rather extreme attitude. And that is not what we necessarily uh, advocate. It is simply the power to move in a world of things, to use these things, but not to allow them to use us. To have what we need, but not allow ourselves to be exploited by the avarice of other persons, trying to lure us and tempt us into an unreasonable relationship with things. That we should quietly gain the capacity to accept or cast aside without these tremendous emotional pressures. That we realize from the beginning that the things we have should be those things which simplify life, which give us necessary protection insofar as things can do this. That these things should be of a nature that will require the least allotment of those values which are above things. A, man, a man's time, the hours that belong to his lifespan here, are far more important than things. And the more of his hours he must devote to his things, the poorer he is. But the things he can see, therefore he considers them valuable. The hours he cannot see, and he has been wasting them for years anyway, therefore he does not regard them as valuable. 
So even while his things are in the process of gradual decline and disintegration, he uh, is more rapid than they are and therefore can leave them behind for someone else to inherit. But he has lost the complete pattern of value. And nations and systems that lose this pattern of value open themselves to war, open themselves to class and industrial struggle, strikes, all kinds of difficulties. And where a great people comes under this common psychosis, we can have conquerors attempting to conquer other peoples simply in order to control the goods and products and things of these other people. By degrees, therefore, things become the object of every conceivable conspiracy, and the defense of them becomes the basis of practically all of the defense strategies of man. In all this, something very important is completely overlooked. The person no longer has a life. His false values, therefore, bring back another karmic reaction on him. Because he believes that which is not true, he must spend his life defending that which is not true. And so he dies, surrounded by his goods which he cannot take, and empty in his own consciousness because he has had no time or inclination to cultivate that which he could take with him. This is all bad uh, interpretation of the principle of value. Orientals also, however, do give us a somewhat different series of patterns, pointing out that illusions are of many kinds and types. Some illusions educate us more than others. Some, some illusions seem to have more value than others. There are nice illusions and not nice illusions. And we are always happy when nice ones come along and we hold on to them desperately until they fall apart between our fingers. Illusions, therefore, can be divided into strata. There are illusions which have tremendous physical fascination. Illusions in which we measure everything in terms of their effect upon our material existence. Here are all the symbols of creature comfort that we know. Here are all the evidences of our prosperity. Here are the endless gadgets and devices for which Western man has become world famous. Then there are other things which we may desire to possess. And these are those things which satisfy our emotional lives. Our emotional lives may not be completely content with physical objects. Our emotional lives demand relationships. They demand friendships, affections, and regards. They want admiration, recognition, opportunities to satisfy certain emotions of pride, or emotions of desire. So we have a whole world of things which cater to our feelings. In this particular world, we have, among other things, art, which is a tremendous emotional instrument, catering to certain psychic hunger within our own natures and perhaps as important to the psychic nature as food is to the body. Now here's an interesting Zen parallel. When a man is hungry and wants food, he has two thoughts in mind, or one of two. Does he wish to eat that which will sustain the body, or does he wish to eat that which merely pleases the senses. Thus the Zen would recommend that for the person who wishes uh, to satisfy a natural hunger in a proper way, that the food be simple. 
but pleasantly served, interesting, and in the oriental way of doing things with that tremendous f emphasis upon textures and flavors and designs. One of the things that you find in oriental meals is simply the sheer beauty of the plate and its contents. It comes into you as a work of art, which is in itself a way of feeding you. Here things come in and uh, they are a little rec reminiscent of Picasso in most cases. <laughs> as a work of art, the average meal is a complete dud, or we might say an outstanding example of post-impressionism, neorealism, or the disillusionment, which had its origin uh, in Montparnasse and Montmartre in uh, Paris. There is something reminiscent of modern art in a handful of wilted fried potatoes. <laughs> this would not happen in an oriental home of any kind of dignity. But food should be simple, natural, and healthy. Now when your soul seeks art, it seeks either nourishment or simply uh, aggrandizement. The soul which in its concept of art wishes ostentation is the same kind of a soul that produces the man who wishes extravagant meals which may make him sick. So as simple food nourishes the body, so simple beauty nourishes the soul. And great art is nearly always simple, with the same quiet, natural message that great food on a physical level would also convey. And then we go on further and we find our possessions, things in terms of mental satisfaction. The mind seeks also the fulfillment of its various purposes and to attain mental possession of things. Men fight with ideas, with knowledge, with skills, with arts, with crafts, and with trades. And here again, simplicity is the secret of honor. Moderation is the secret of strength. And honor is the secret of success. So gradually, out of the experience of ages, men come to the recognition of the simple life. The simplification of things until that small group of things which we do possess have become truly meaningful, and they have become instruments of liberation. They are no longer possessed because we demand ownership. They are possessed as we should possess a friend, simply because it is a privilege to share certain things. And when the friend desires to go, we bid him Godspeed with as much peace as we welcomed him. I know cases where a great collector of Oriental art has uh, observed that some person was deeply moved, tremendously affected by a beautiful art object, and turned around and gave it to him. The owner was liberated. He enjoyed it, he could enjoy having it, he could enjoy not having it. He could also greatly enjoy the fact that he had given joy to someone else by passing it on to him. And all things, according to the Chinese connoisseur, must ultimately belong to the individual who most greatly appreciates them. Therefore, appreciation is another kind of coinage, a coinage above money by which things which are deserved cannot ultimately be prevented uh, from coming in some form or in some way to those who deserve them. Very often we get what we deserve, what we want, what we desire, without ever possessing it, because reward does not have to be possessed. It can be experienced without ownership. 
gradually the world settles into a different kind of a relationship with life. The individual is no longer afraid of what he has or for what he has because this power of these things to control him, this power has gradually been relinquished. In this procedure, of course, we have a form of discipline. This discipline, by the way, is good Zen. And Zen always starts where you are. Zen is not a procedure in which we uh, wait until we reach a very high degree of renunciation or something, and then suddenly jump into the ocean of the doctrine. This is not the point. Zen always begins where you are. And this also brings another interesting aspect of Zen into focus. It is not at all certain that the Zen experience is identical with any two human beings. We have always thought of reality as something in which everybody finally came to a magnificent agreement with everybody else. And we have been working toward that, not too industriously, but uh, moderately. We are always hoping, of course, that we will be the one with whom, in the end, all others will agree. <laughs> this, incidentally, is a false hope, and we hope you will recover from it as quickly as possible. But there is no proof that Zen is a standardized, a standardized experience. There is no proof that we will all ultimately discover it to be round or square or flat. There is nothing that indicates that the path of Zen is into a path of conformity with other people. Actually, Zen is an experience by means of which we come into a new relationship with ourselves. And by the time we reach the higher degrees of Zen, which lead to the doctrine of the void or the ultimate emptiness of illusion, there is no actual evidence that we will ever actually come to a state where we will consciously shake hands with everyone else and say the world is now of one mind. Uh, it is unlikely that this will happen. Zen doesn't feel that this is the basis of the brotherhood of man. Zen says that the brotherhood of man is based upon each individual respecting the experience of others that there is no need to agree. The only need is that there shall be earnest endeavor, and that this earnestness is the ground of kinship, not agreement as to the final attainments or the final opinions or conclusions. This is why Zen refuses to dogmatize any subject. But in our search for value, or the uh, value of things, there is no way in which we can indicate that anything has a fixed value, nor will be of equal value to any two persons in this world. Nor is there any way in which we can say that a certain object, fetish-like or like a talisman, can produce some extraordinary magical benefit upon anyone who comes in contact with it. These various magical devices seemingly produce certain effects upon some people and no effect upon other people. Actually, therefore, the price or the value of a thing can never be determined. A thing has no value except the values placed upon it by the innumerable owners, possessors, or desirers of these things. And uh, these persons have their value as an experience of their own consciousness. And there is no evidence that any two persons are in agreement on this. The only way what appears to be agreement can be attained is by some pricing system 
by which all persons are required to pay the same amount for a thing. It being assumed, therefore, that if they do this, they all value it equally. This is also untrue, because the persons buying these things all value that with which they buy them differently. And one man will say, my goodness, this costs a hundred dollars. My, that's a lot. And another person will say, what? Only a hundred dollars? It's cheap. This is how we value the hundred dollars, not how we value the object. We have come constantly to the wrong uh, focal point in terms of value. We think of the thing when we should be trying to understand the motive in ourselves by which these things seem to take on meaning. Now, as we go along refining our interests in life, as through the discipline of our own consciousness, we turn from the more obvious interests to those of greater meaning, greater ethical, moral, or psychic value. This refinement procedure affects our concept of what is valuable around us. Also, it affects our concept of how and what we should do on certain levels of function. For example, we recently read of the painting in New York that was of Rembrandt that was sold for over two million dollars. This uh, was an enormous price, one of the largest prices ever paid for a picture. But why was it so valuable? Probably the value of it belongs to an experience of folk consciousness. Actually, as the Chinese point out, in the course of time, that which is essentially good gradually comes to the surface. That which is not good gradually sinks into oblivion. There is no question as to the artistic skill of Rembrandt van Rijn. He was a very great artist. But there is an absurdity about estimating his picture in the terms of $2 million. This $2 million represents, therefore, a certain applause, a certain tribute paid to the artist. But as the Zen would point out, if this picture is worth $2 million, it is priceless. It has no money value at all. Because if it has money value, it will gradually go up until no one can buy it. Then the picture is uh, are no longer of value to anyone. The money value is only a tribute paid to it in an era of inflated economic consciousness. The picture is either good or bad. The picture is either worthless or valuable. There is every reason to assume that this picture is valuable. Valuable because of the quality of the work. Valuable because it strikes into our own subconscious and we are glad to see the picture. Our own psychic life, therefore, is moved into recognition of the merit of the subject. And this merit causes us to recognize value. But we might see equally merit in a small clay bowl that was dug out of a mound in Korea, which maybe 1,500 years ago was used by a farmer to warm his tea. Bowls of that type and kind today, if they appear on the market, also bring fantastic prices. Not as much as a Rembrandt, because we do not know them as well. Or not because, uh, or because we are, they are not so obviously dramatic. But it is not uncommon for a bowl that probably cost a hundredth of a cent when it was made, made in Korea during one of the better periods, to sell today for twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars, because of a value which we have come to recognize and also because of scarcity and many other factors. 
It is gradually notable, however, that as individuals do move along the path of enlightenment, they become more and more concerned with intangible values and are ever more willing to satisfy their psychic need at the expense of their physical luxuries or possessions. There are a great many people, for example, who would be perfectly willing to live on a much more economical scale than to give up good music, or would be perfectly willing to uh, economize in creature comforts in order to own great art. This is because finally their sense of value has moved into a less obvious field. Now many of these people defend their decision on the grounds of good investment, but the great art lover is not ever going to sell, so the investment problem is only for his descendants. He has secured these things because he wants them. Now he will outgrow them. He will also have to serve them, and he will take on the karma of them, just as he would with any other material object, because they are material objects of some kind. But they appeal to a better nature in himself. And on the nature of value, or of the true worth of a thing, the final value is determined in its meaning what it can contribute to the unfoldment of the consciousness of the person who is its temporary owner. As we become more discriminating and more selective, therefore, more interested in fulfilling the internal need of life rather than its material situations, we begin to develop more refined instincts in art and music and literature and all kinds of important things of this kind. In this way also, we begin to release the world and ourselves from very much of the competition and pressure of things. The person who is interested only in value, true value, is not a heavy competitor in the ordinary affairs of life, is not going to war for his possessions and things of that nature. He is naturally a peace-loving, law-abiding, thoughtful citizen. Quently, his karma moves in these directions. How is it then that in the idea of Buddhism or in Zen, that we do not have the complete rejection of all things in a sense, Buddha does give us this complete rejection, but his faith never accepted it. It never accepted the loss of beauty as a factor in religion. It never lost the fine painting or the magnificent carving. And gradually these were brought to adorn the very temples themselves. The same was true of Christian art. For well, while Christianity began as a very simple faith, there can be no doubt that men have heaped upon the shrines of their faiths, their richest and noblest possessions, given great, generously and often with great contrition of spirit as an indication that inner consolation is more important than worldly goods. This type of thing we have always noted. Zen does not condemn beauty, but it does try to make it as simple as possible. Zen also tells us something else about things, namely that we become beggared uh, to the skills and abilities of other people. Today, most of everything that we have, we buy in some degree of completeness. Little by little, we lose practically all creativity in ourselves. We are a great age of buyers, not an age of creators. And we do recognize and applaud those geniuses who produce some extraordinary or unusual uh, work of art, and we probably will fairly generously support them. But the average person is not creative. 
25, 35 years ago, it was customary for practically all families to at least have some music in their homes. Music probably mostly meant the piano, or singing, or a mandolin, or a guitar. But these younger people, and often with their parents and friends and neighbors, created music. Maybe not as good as the high fidelity of today, but at least creative. They were doing it themselves. And in the, as a mystical experience in man, uh, actually, to be able to pick out silver threads among the gold on the piano with one <laughs> finger gives more creativity than a great symphony that you simply listen to and do nothing about yourself. There is no participation, and while appreciation is a great value, participation is of great necessity also. We have ceased to be creative. Zen would like to bring this back. It would like to do it through the encouragement of the whole concept of folk art and folk lore. It would like every person to be able to do something himself. Where the Zen people came from, Japan and China, they had one advantage that we do not have. Their families and their trading had much to do with skill in writing. In Japan and China, writing is an art, and the written forms are considered as beautiful as pictorial design. When you write a beautiful poem, and you are a fine... Uh, have a fine example of writing. You are a good man with the brush. If you have this, you have produced a work of art in which your thoughts have been expressed through a very skillful use of your writing materials. Thus, most of your Orientals are halfway on the road to be painters by the time they are ten years old because they have learned so marvelously to handle their brushes. Uh, they can turn almost immediately to various forms of artistic composition. And it is not at all uncommon in a Japanese family for the guests uh, to uh, produce or make art work as a symbol of their friendship among themselves. Here in this country, we have guest books. And when you have a party, your friends all sign the guest book. In Japan, you have little cards with gold edges that are supplied for this purpose. And on these cards, you write a poem, or you draw a picture, or both. Or you do something out of your own creativity, and you leave it with your host as a present. He is greatly honored. Everybody is profoundly pleased with the whole proceeding. And it is astonishing to see what you get. Uh, I know I have seen a number of collections of these things that have been in Japanese families. Here is a magnificent painting of storms and rocks and sea. A beautiful work, as fine as anything you could find anywhere. It was not done by a professional artist. It was done by an honored guest who was a politician. Beautiful work of art. The next one was a wonderful painting of a small child, marvelously executed with the greatest detail. This one was done by a doctor who visited the family. So what do you have? You have engineers that are ivory carvers. You have doctors that are painters. You have politicians that are musicians. You have tradesmen who do most marvelous and delicate things. You will even find a magnificent poem, marvelously done, beautifully written by the family masseur or something of that nature. The gardener, who has already learned to work marvels with plants, is also able to make a beautiful drawing of a branch of cherry blossoms and a little bird. The man who you would call here the delivery man for some grocer store 
will leave you a beautiful little memento on the holiday season, a drawing which would be worthy of a great artist. He did it himself. Now this helps something. It means a tremendous amount in value. It means that these people have never lost the ability to create in themselves some expression to move consciousness out into action. When a great family in Japan ceases or passes out of existence and their possessions 